Hello everyone, I'm Kirsten with Ambler Nutrition at Center on the Hill. Today we're talking about diabetes nutrition, meal planning. Um, it's actually the best nutrition for anyone with diabetes is the most nutritious diet. So this is for everyone, whether you want to lose weight, whether you want to gain weight, whether you have kidney disease, whether you have a heart disease or cancer or any of these things, I'm going to talk to you about how to get the most nutrition into your diet. So hold on to your seats. Here we go. This is the diabetes healthy eating conversation map that I, I bring um, every second week of the month. We're continuing this on Mondays and Tuesdays, are the first and the second weeks for um, January, February, and March. So here we are in December already. It just happens to start snowing <laughs> this afternoon. So I feel that's a good sign. We're gonna have a nice cozy winter alone, you know, isolating and everything. It's good to see everybody. I don't have my mask on. It's so much easier for you to hear me now. So let's just go over this. Um, this is like a, a little pathway of, of nutrition. And we start at the corner where we see a bunch of people at a, coffee, at a picnic table having a delicious uh, picnic meal or, or takeout meal or, or whatever it is. And, um, and next to it is somebody having some ice cream. And uh, the one guy here has a frown on his face. I wanna start this right off. People with diabetes can have sweets. We just break it up into the uh, food groups. Um, the ice cream and the sweets are gonna be the carbohydrates. And we wanna have carbohydrates and fiber, proteins and fat at every meal. So if you know that you're gonna have a celebration, there's gonna be cake or ice cream or different kinds of sweets during that meal, you're just not gonna have as many carbohydrates, maybe none, just have the vegetables and the protein um, and then uh, enjoy the carbohydrates. It's really important to have the carbohydrates, to have these sweets, whatever it is, right at the end of the meal. I know all of our families, we have our dinner and then we wait a couple of hours and then we have the, shirt, the sweets. Don't do that. The best thing to do, whether you have diabetes or not, is to have it right with the meal. Your body has given enough insulin, whether it's through your pancreas or through medication to um, balance that whole meal with insulin. And when you wait a couple hours or even one hour, it just extends how long your high blood sugar is. Um, that's the whole key with losing weight, gaining weight, uh, uh, balancing your blood sugar with diabetes or kidney disease, all these kind of things, is to have little pockets of your day where you're going to have high blood sugar. So that's going to be a couple hours after breakfast, a couple hours after lunch, and a couple hours after dinner. Your digestion works so much better if you can have uh, most of your calories before 3 p.m. So that means having a big breakfast with carbohydrates, fiber, proteins, and fat. The carbohydrates and the fiber are the plants, whether it's spinach or onions or peppers or berries, um, fruit, uh, all of these have carbohydrates and fiber in them. The vegetables are going to have less car. The vegetables and the berries are going to have less carbohydrates than, uh, say, peaches or pineapples or apples and that kind of thing. Um, pears have a lot of fiber and so do prunes. So something to think about. And then the protein uh, and the fat, they usually go together, whether it's eggs, because there's a little bit of fat in the yolk or in the butter that you're sauteing it in, or um, chicken has skin on it. Uh, nuts have peanut oil, you know, almond oil, walnut oil. So they kind of go for the plants and the proteins. You get those two things in every meal, you're going to have a nice uh, balance. Your sugar is not going to, your blood sugar is not going to spike. And uh, your insulin is going to maintain uh, that moderate blood sugar rise uh, when you have all four food groups uh, with the insulin, whether again, you have to take it as medicine or you have it as um, in your pancreas. Um, okay, so eating a balanced diet, having the carbs for sweets with that meal right at the end, um, looking at um, the, the uh, you know, potluck picnics and things like that. Um, everyone wants to bring the most favorite dish. So you know there's gonna be some really wonderful foods there, probably high in fat and carbs. So if you bring something that is more protein or is more vegetables, um, there's a lot of different uh, broccoli salads and um, potato salad that has cauliflower, 50-50. Um, things that are not so high in carbohydrates have more fibers in them. Um, if you're gonna bring a, a vegetarian lasagna, that's another great option. You know, put some sausages in it, even if you wanted to do that. But the sausage does have some fat and protein, and then you have the carbohydrates from the noodles and the vegetables. Pack that uh, lasagna with lots of noodle, or lots of 
vegetables, you know, peppers and onions and mushrooms, broccoli. I mean, all these things, can, zucchini, uh, eggplant, all this stuff can be um, ground up or sauteed and added to the red sauce. And it makes the lasagna very interesting. You may only get two layers of noodles when you have that much vegetables and, and stuff like that. That's something to think about. So uh, potluck dinners, um, again, bring something that you know you can eat and have a moderate amount, you know, small amount of the things that you know is high in carbohydrates with not a lot of nutrition. Still go to these things. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If they're having a potluck and you know that it's a mac and cheese world, so you bring a broccoli salad and you have some mac and cheese and some broccoli salad, you're still in great shape and you get to be with everybody. Right now, let's face facts, people aren't really getting together. But still, when this is all going to resolve, hopefully this summer, and there's going to be all kinds of picnics, and you're going to bring some nutritious food. That's what I'm hoping. So if we get into the upper part here with the store, it says meal planning. So when you go to the grocery store, you know you want to have vegetables for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when I say vegetables for breakfast, I mean berries. They're very low in carbohydrates and high in fiber. So that's just like the, uh, vegetables. So think about if you're going to shop for 10 days, you're going to need 30 servings, right? So, and if that's just for you, and if you have your uh, partner or you have a family, you're looking at a whole lot more. Look at the frozen food. Look at the canned artichokes and uh, beans and peas and things like that. The ca canned corn, canned carrots. Oh my gosh, they're so yummy. These are plants and these are very good for you. And now um, soups are the one thing that I'm worried about. Um, most of them you can find that are low sodium. They don't taste that great. But if you do get one, I mean, you're going to get one that's high sodium. I'm just going to tell you, I got a really good um, uh, Progresso lentil soup the other day. I think, no, actually, it was the, well, even still, the all these pea soup is amazing. It's just so rich and delicious. The sodium in that is like eight or 900 milligrams per serving, and the can holds three servings, really. So what you do with that is you have this delicious soup, whether it's a vegetable soup, a, a lentil soup, a pea soup, whatever these uh, high nutritious protein soups are, bean soups, and you're going to add uh, a cup or two of cooked broccoli or cooked carrots, or you're going to saute onions and peppers and mushrooms, and then you're going to add that to the soup. That way your um, non-salted foods will double the volume of this very salty soup, and that cuts the sodium in half. So that way you're not going to be thirsty when you go to bed having this delicious soup that is so salty because you're not going to have as much. It's going to be diluted with uh, frozen vegetables or canned vegetables, whichever ones you like. Um, but that's a really good option. So when you're going to the store, think about um, what the vegetables are going to be for the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everybody knows about how to how much chicken or tuna fish or um, pork chops or steak and stuff. I would rather you substituted some of the plant-based foods in there. It's going to be really good for your pancreas and, and all of our bodies. Um, not to have meat 21 times a week. Maybe you have it four or five times a week, a couple times for lunch, a couple times for dinner, something like that. I'm um, looking in incorporating more beans and incorporating the Beyond Meat sausage with grilled vegetables or the the, uh, beyond or uh, the impossible burger as a meatloaf um, or you looking at the um, breakfast sausage um, gimme lean instead of jimmy bean it's gimme lean from light life that's amazing and, and sauteing that up with onions and peppers and you know just doing great things but, but then there's also the, the vegetable soups for breakfast or for lunch and, and for dinner like I said the pea soups the bean soups um, lentil soups but you may they might be salty so you might have to add some vegetables to it when you're looking at the labels the food companies know that people are looking for sugars, so they will hide the sugar as fillers. So um, it might the package might say only three cups, uh, three tablespoons, or three grams of sugar, but in real in real life, it has 50 grams of carbs, and that's because they have added all these different gels and dextrose and things like that. All these fillers, they're carbohydrates, and they do raise our blood sugar. So pretty much because the um, food companies have figured a way to get away from writing down how much uh, carbo you know, sweets there are and these, how much added sugar this is. Um, people get a false sense of security and they buy the product. The companies like that. Look at the carbohydrates. You really want to have about four, you know, 30 to 45 per uh, meal. This is whether you're gaining weight or losing weight. There's no sense in having 60 or 90 grams of carbs in a meal, um, overloading your body and, and causing yourself to your liver to make yourself have extra fat cells when you really want to gain weight with extra muscle cells. And same thing if you're overweight, if you can gain extra muscle cells, uh, muscle burns fat when you're sleeping. If you ever get sick, your body goes after the muscle first, not the fat. 
So we don't need all that fat. The only thing fat does is keeps us warm in winter. <laughs> Anyway, so um, look at the labels, um, look at the serving size, look at the ingredients, try to see uh, foods that are, um, you know, manufactured, that they don't have a lot of uh, chemical additives to them. You want to be able to understand, you know, wheat, cane sugar, uh, you know, pureed strawberries, artificial, uh, natural flavorings, um, even the carrageenan gum, I think is fine. But when it gets into like polysorbate 80 and, and all these uh, you know, chemical phosphates and stuff. Uh, you don't need that. And it's really bad for your gut biome. So again, look at the nutrition label, look how much carbohydrates it has. You want to have it to be less than 45 grams per meal. And you also want to look at the protein, depending on your size, you may want only 12 grams of protein. You might be a bigger person and you're looking more like 25 grams of pro protein. Um, you really can't go wrong with having, um, say, 30 grams of protein for breakfast and lunch. Just don't have that much protein for dinner. The dinner protein, you want to be much less than the breakfast and the lunch. The breakfast and lunch, your body can digest it, no problem. The dinner, your body is like you. It's tired, it's dark, it doesn't want to work, it wants to go to bed. So having more of your meals, um, more of your food for breakfast and lunch, you will lose weight, you will build more muscle, um, and then having more vegetables and, and vegetable soups and other things like that for dinner. Um, this weekend, it's going to be in the 56, 58 degrees. Um, maybe you want a salad for dinner again, like in the summer. So uh, plan your meals accordingly and definitely, you know, have an idea what you want to do when you go to the grocery store, because now we're trying not to go to the store as often. A lot of people are ordering, uh, having the shipment instead of doing, um, you know, going every couple of days. We are absolutely not going to the grocery store every couple of days anymore. It's not worth it. Um, the vaccine is coming out, but we're all not going to get it until, what, February, March, April, May, some of these people. So, um, you know, try to go shopping uh, more, uh, more days in between your shopping trips and pick your vegetables. Again, the frozen selection is fantastic. I'm a big fan of Aldi's and Walmart. Uh, Walmart is Find out when Walmart closes and go just before or find out when they open and just go right when they open. <laughs> Don't go at mealtime. It's really busy there. Um, but let's see. So we got the nutrition facts. We've got the, the grocery store making a plan. Um, there's special uh, you know, days that we have. We have uh, family celebrations, dinner parties, sporting events, eating alone, sick days. These are challenges that you might face. Um, plan for them. So if you're eating alone, make yourself a plate. And then if you're going to watch TV or if you're going to read a book or a magazine or whatever you're going to do, um, it's better if you can concentrate. It's always better if you can concentrate on your food and not the TV. Um, I can tell a couple stories I've told. Um, I do this myself. If I'm going to have some popcorn or some chips um, and I'm going to be watching TV, I'll have a little bowl and I enjoy them. And my husband will sit next to me and I'm having like one or two and I look and the whole bowl is gone. And I'm like, honey, did you just eat on my popcorn or my whatever? He goes, I didn't have a single one. And he's telling the truth. You don't know how much you eat when you're sitting there uh, in front of the TV. So that's why you need to have a plate or have a bowl of, you know, this is how much I'm going to have. And then when that's done and you're still hungry, have a drink of water. You very well could be thirsty. Maybe even start with that and then um, you have the snack. But, I, you know, I'm not saying don't have snacks. I'm just saying measuring them out and know that, you know, that's what you're going to have and you're going to enjoy them. Um, let's see. Family celebrations, like I said, whether it's champagne or it's cake, if it's a kid's party, if it's an adult party, you want to have a good meal before you start having the, the carbohydrates or the toxins that is the alcohol. Um, I can talk about that later, but um, for family celebrations, like I said, your meal before that is mostly gonna be the protein and the vegetables, and then you're gonna not have the potato, not have the bread, not have the noodles or whatever it is, and then save the carbohydrates for the cake or the, the mixed drinks or that kind of thing, um, the ice cream. So we wanna participate with our family and, and uh, and that kind of thing. Even if you're doing a Zoom thing and everybody's sitting around eating cake, you don't wanna be sitting there with a salad. You wanna have the cake too. So that's what I'm saying. Um, dinner parties, like I said, with the, with the potlucks, we're gonna be doing that hopefully in the summer. We're all gonna to get together, bring the nutritious thing that you know you can eat, taste everybody else's, but know that you know yours is the most nutritious one and, and you have something to eat while you're there. Um, sporting events, 
Um, the link for football, they do have a, a good kitchen situation, but I have found that, you know, the Flyers and the Sixers, um, <laughs> it's not as a uh, variety, you know, they have a lot of bread in their hoagies and their pizza, their popcorn, it's a lot of carbs, There's, you're not going to get a good meal there. So have a good meal before you go. That's a great idea. Um, you know, if you're going to do tailgating, that's a perfect time to bring the sausages and grilled vegetables. And if you're going to use the Beyond Meat sausage, ha, people won't know. It's really good. Um, let's see. Uh, same thing with the um, Impossible Burger. Uh, it comes out bloody. You put it on the grill and it turns brown. It's unbelievable. It does have a lot of uh, uh, ingredients in it. Um, I feel the ingredients are not bad. I feel they're pretty good ingredients. If you looked at the feed that they feed chickens and cows and pork, um, you wouldn't believe all the chemicals that those kids, those kids, <laughs> those animals are eating in their um, protein, in their meat, in their muscles, and, and then we eat that. So the difference between having a conventionally raised chicken versus um, having the um, tofu crumbles, I'm going to tell you the tofu crumbles are going to be better for you. So, and, um, but th if you do have a special occasion and, and you have a farmer who does have pastured chickens where the chickens are out eating grass, um, that is a plus. Same thing with the grass fed beef. Uh, I would not recommend eating these things 21 times a week, but again, you know, four or five times a week, uh, is not a big deal. Um, and, and break it up and you want to include more beans and fiber. That's the big thing. Um, again, eating alone, give yourself a plate. And on sick days. So some people are in medicine, whether it's metformin or Ozempic or um, Guardians, all these different kinds of medicines. If you have diabetes and you are not eating, say you have a stomach bug, your blood sugar is elevated because your body is fighting a sickness. It's uh, under stress. So your blood sugar is high. So keep taking your medicine like you normally do. Even though you didn't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, take some of that Nova log or whatever medicine you have at meals the same time like you normally do. It's amazing how your body has this memory of what, uh, when it knows the blood sugar is gonna go up and it is ready to, to increase your blood sugar or increase your insulin. And if you take medicine like you normally do for people who are insulin deficient, that maintains that rhythm. And like I said, whether you eat a piece of cake, you have a tooth infection, you break your leg, your sugar is high. So we wanna make sure we keep our medicine uh, on the same schedule as it was before. Um, as much as possible, because I know you're sleeping and um, definitely tell people if you're um, sick, if you live alone and, and you get the flu and uh, you know that you're going to be sleeping through breakfast, lunch and dinner, have somebody give you a call or set some timers. Um, I, just tell your family and friends that, you know, you're not feeling well. If you could check in on me for breakfast, lunch and dinner, that will help me with my medicines. And, and that would be people are happy to do this. So, uh, and like I said, if, if everybody's traveling or everybody's under this holiday craziness, um, set some timers and, and take care of yourself that way, but don't skip a dose. I really can't. The other thing is if you're not eating and you're sleeping, um, have some water that also reduces your blood sugar. It washes the uh, blood sugar out of your veins. It goes into your kidneys and pee it out. It's really great. So if you can drink eight ounces every hour, fantastic, but you're not feeling good. So even if you could just drink four ounces. Um, but the big thing with being sick is not low blood sugar. It's very high blood sugar. Um, so that's a sick day. Um, oh, greasy's burger joint right there. Uh, just so you know, when you eat something that's greasy, whether it's um, olive oil on a pesto pasta dish, whether it's fried chicken, whether it's a fried pickle or whatever it is, and it's got a lot of grease in it, a lot of oil in it. Um, the first thing when you eat it, it goes into your bloodstream and it goes right into your insulin receptors. Whether you have diabetes or not, it blocks the insulin from uh, letting the sugar out of your bloodstream and into your cells. So when your liver notices, hey, it's been like an hour and uh, sugar or two hours or three hours sometimes, uh, the sugar is still in your veins, the liver just takes it and makes fat out of it. It's the worst. It can make a fatty liver first and then it makes um, abdominal fat. So um, watch out for those really greasy foods. Um, try to have some vegetables and things before you have it. Try to blot it like with pizza. You can fold it in half and put the oil, put the grease drain out of it. If you can pat it with um, paper towels, like fried chicken, have it in with paper towels and so it can absorb some of it. But the big thing is having a lot of vegetables beforehand, that fiber and things get the insulin in place originally. And then the fat hits, um, at least you got some of the uh, insulin receptors open with the, the vegetables. Oh, Greece's burger joint. Again, animal protein is going to have way more fat 
than these plant-based proteins. People who go vegan lose weight because they're having uh, beans and like I said, the um, impossible burger or you know the tofu crumbles and things. There's like literally no fat, maybe one or two grams compared to 30 or 40% fat for some of these other um, you know, steak and you know the juicy steaks and that kind of thing. I'm not saying never have it again, but just have it with vegetables and you know have it once a month or something like that, but just not every day. Um, oh, Grease's burger joint with the protein. Yeah, look at the plant-based proteins. Um, if you're going to a burger joint, a lot of them will have the impossible burger, like um, Burger King. Even uh, Turn a Knob over in uh, by Center City, uh, that that Irish pub had impossible burgers. Now I'm telling you, I had it and I'm thinking, I don't know if this is a possible burger. The waitress said, no, I specifically got it out of the freezer. We put it on the grill. It really is it. So um you know, look at the, the plant-based options. That's what I'm saying. You can still be with your sports friends and still have, you know, a great burger. Um, and then here, Mike's Bar and Grill. This has to do with alcohol. Yes, the mixers are going to have carbohydrates in the drinks. An eight ounce glass of soda is 30 grams of, of uh, carbs. So whether it's juice or soda, it's the same thing. We do not need juice in our life unless it's V8. <laughs> uh, V8, you're not going to drink eight ounces of V8. Um, but four ounces is uh, something like 350 milligrams of sodium. It's not that bad. Um, having that a few times a week is not a big deal. If you had it every day, if you had a low salt diet, that's going to be balanced out. Um, you're looking for sodium as um, 500 or 800 milligrams. The, that's going to be the limit, uh, depending on your heart condition. Some people are not affected with um, salt in their bloodstream as causing high blood pressure. A large part, you know, so see if it affects you, then watch out for it. The only thing is there is some recent studies about people who have a high salt diet. And I'm talking about in Asia where they have a lot of uh, salted fish and uh, soy, soy, um, soy sauce and things like that. They, even though they're more vegetarian, they seem to have more strokes. So watch out with the salt because of the strokes, unfortunately. Um, but the Mike's Bar and Grill, so alcohol. Alcohol does not have carbs, it, they have a toxin. <laughs> so our bodies have what's called a alcohol dehydrogenase. It's an uh, enzyme that can break down that alcohol. Yay, men have three times as much as women. So we have to think about it as a woman. If the man is having three beers, maybe you wanna cut it off at one. Um, they can walk around fine, they can break it down. We cannot, um, there's other people too. You know what your alcohol tolerance is. So that has to do with how much this enzyme you have. Um, if you know that you're going to be out celebrating and you normally don't drink, even if you do drink, have something in your stomach first, some some fat, some fiber, some protein, um, you know, some chicken and vegetables, uh, hard boiled eggs and, and salad, something like this so that the alcohol can't get through your bloodstream. This is the same thing with simple carbs. Like if you're going to a party and, you know, you're going to have some cake or some ice cream or something like that, have a meal first that has the fiber, the protein and the fat. They digest slowly and they'll block those simple carbs from getting into your bloodstream so quickly. Uh, the biggest way to increase your blood sugar and just have it stay up there all the time is have a whole bunch of sugar like donuts or something with fat. Oh, donuts are greasy, too. So that's a pretty bad combination. Have a breakfast before you have the donuts. That's what I'm just saying. Because that breakfast is going to have, you know, the protein, the fat, and the fiber, whether it's eggs and spinach, whether it's uh, protein pancakes with some berries, whether um, it's going to be a granola with some soy milk. Again, all of these have carbs and protein together with a lot of fiber. Um, let's see. So alcohol. Over here, we have a farmer's market. They sort of put it in the food groups, but not really. This page has been um, made in 2014. We didn't know as much about food groups as, as we do now. But if you were to think about, um, okay, so let's look at what is, um, where's the protein? So the protein is gonna be actually in the vegetables, in the meats. Um, a lot of times the meat section will have the plant-based proteins in there too. Um, the dairy, the milk, they call it milk, but it's the dairy section. Um, in the dairy section, down at the end, they'll have the non-dairy things, whether it's sour cream. They're really good with the sour cream and the cream cheese right now. Um, I think it's made by Tua Foodie or something, but um, take a look at those, especially if you're lactose intolerant. Um, they have the same or more protein in them than uh, the traditional milk 
um, variety and they really, uh, they fixed it. They, they taste good now. Um, I can hardly tell the difference between the two. Maybe natural um, sour cream made with dairy is a little more salty, um, but they're, they both have very, uh, really improved flavor. So if you're gonna be cooking with something and it calls for a lot of sour cream, that is a lot of animal protein and a lot of fat. So take a look at the, um, the tofu based ones in the cooler. But again, so the milk, uh, Greek yogurt has a lot of protein in it. So does um, cottage cheese, uh, 15 grams per half a cup, it's a lot. Uh, would not recommend having this every day, but just so you know, the protein is gonna be in the milk. The vegetables that are high in protein is broccoli, asparagus, uh, Brussels sprouts, peas, spinach, collard greens. Those are the top. Um, a, a cup of those is the same thing as an egg. And a cup of cooked spinach or cooked collard greens is as much as two eggs. So there's a lot of protein in these vegetables. Of course, the meat, every ounce is gonna have seven grams of protein, whether it's an ounce of steak or one egg. Can you believe it? I always think that, you know, the steak would have more protein. Uh, it does not. It actually has more fat. <laughs> so take a look at the eggs. Um, okay, so we got the protein in, in there. If we think about um, the fats, so that can be in the sweets, um, whether it's a donut or uh, frosting on a cake. Um, ice cream has a lot of fat in it. Um, uh, the uh, the other, you know, donuts, what else? And then um, the other thing where we would get fats is, um, well, avocados and nuts and things. I don't see how that would fit. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Farmer's market doesn't have nuts and seeds. So nuts and seeds are really, really, really good for you. Um, beans also, they have a little bit of fat. Um, and when you make beans like bean soup or, or hummus or these kind of things, you can make the hummus with the chickpea canned juice. You don't have to add so much olive oil to it. But um, a little olive oil tastes great. Again, we only need about four tablespoons of olive oil a day for an adult. Um, uh, a bigger adult is gonna need four or five, a smaller adult is gonna need you know, three, two or three. So um, think about where you are and, and realize that, um, again, fat goes right to your insulin receptors and then you can't reduce your blood sugar whether you have diabetes or not. And without high blood sugar, the liver makes fat. <laughs> so I would rather you gain weight by muscle, not by making fat. I'm always about making muscle. Okay, so we got the protein, we got the fats. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a nut vendor, but that's another place where you get fats besides the meats. Um, and then uh, the carbohydrates, the carbohydrates are gonna be in the sweets, they're gonna be in the vegetables, they're gonna be in the milk, they're gonna be in the fruits, and they're gonna be in the starches. So all of this, except for here, the meat section has carbohydrates in it. Um, but the concentrated carbohydrates are definitely gonna be with the sweets, you know, um, or the fats like pizza or donuts, um, that's gonna be fat and carbohydrates. Cake is not as much fat, but it still has a lot, ice cream same. And then um, the starches. So whether it's a grain or it's, you know, like um, a barley or a quinoa or brown rice, that carbohydrate, even though it is 100% carbohydrate with a little bit of protein and a good amount of fiber, that good amount of fiber and that complex carbohydrate in that unrefined uh, grain is not going to increase your blood sugar like white rice or um, white bread, even wheat bread uh, really shoots our sugar up fast. Um, whether you have a spoonful of jelly or a piece of white bread, it's the same thing. So um, every time you're having and a bagel is like six pieces of bread. So think about these big New York bagels. Um, definitely do this when you're running a marathon or you're going on a hike, something that you need this energy for. If you're going to be doing yard work. Yeah, that would be a good day to have pancakes or bagels and that kind of thing. But if you know it's a rainy day and you're going to be staying inside watching movies, uh, you don't need a lot of carbohydrates. You know, they're really for instant energy. Um, having more of you know, the vegetable soups or having um, berries on, um, you know, granola. Take a look at the granolas. Actually, take a look at my website. I have, um, actually on my website, I have news. My website is amblernutrition.com and my Facebook page for Ambler Nutrition, I have put some recipes. Um, they're uh, nutritious sweets. <laughs> made with dark chocolate. I have a, a bark and I have a peanut butter ball, but I also have some appetizers on there, some bean dip things that you can put on toast and stuff like that for the holidays. Um, but that that's some ideas for you. Um, let's see. So we talked about the carbohydrates, the protein, the fat, and then the fiber is also in um, the the grains and the sweets that are in the, the um, donuts and the breakfast cereals and the pizza, you do have a little bit of fiber in there, one or two grams, which is not very much. We're looking for about 10 grams per meal. 
Um, meats are not going to have any fiber. There's no, we don't get fiber from bones or skin or feathers or anything like that. There's no fiber in meats. Vegetables loaded with fiber. Um, a, a half a cup of broccoli is five grams already. So if you're having a couple, like in a salad, you're having a couple cups of lettuce with, or a cup of lettuce with um, a cup of vegetables, um, you've got like almost 15 grams right there. So it's, it's wonderful. Vegetables are the number one. Vegetables, beans, um, whole grains, these have lots of fiber. Prunes, five prunes, um, that's like 10, 15 grams of fiber. It's really good. Um, dairy is not going to have any fiber in it, except if you get the yogurt with the fruit in it, that fruit might have a little bit of fiber. Um, fruits are great, um, especially the, the, uh, the prunes. Dried fruit is very concentrated sugar. Uh, I would not, you know, two tablespoons is the same thing as a piece of bread. So it's, it's like jelly. So think about the dried fruits as, as like jelly, except for the, um, the, the prunes. They have so much fiber and they also have an enzyme that help uh, build our bones. So people who have uh, five prunes a day, they are shown to have less uh, osteoporosis. So that's a nice thing. Um, and then the starches, again, they're talking about um, bread and bagels and pasta and rice and things like that. We want, really want to do whole grain. Look at the multi-grain breads. Again, the fiber is what is really key. And the, the key is, um, it, so it's only 20 up. So the key is um, the fiber uh, in our intestines and our stomach is bugs. And these bugs are great. They help us balance our hormones. They help us uh, uh, break down new, uh, the food that we eat so we can get more nutrition out of them. Um, they just regulate our whole body. And, it, and they huge, 70% of our immune system. These guys are really, really important and they thrive on fiber. So the more fiber you can have, whether it's vegetables or whole grains, um, try to get several servings. You want five cups of vegetables a day. You're looking for, you know, 25, 30 grams of fiber a day. So we really want to uh, get in this fiber for these bugs. Um, like I said, they really carry us. Um, the human body, I can go into all this detail, but there's a huge connection with people who have a healthy community down there. Their blood sugars, whether they have diabetes or not, are a lot in, in a better uh, range. Um, again, they their hormones are more balanced. They sleep better. They have clearer uh, brains. They have less cholesterol issues. You know, they, their cholesterol is balanced. So, um, if you can add beans, if you know, edamame beans to soups or salads, uh, quinoa again, soups and salads are fantastic with that. Um, any dish where you're having grilled vegetables, adding quinoa to the meal, those juices from the grilled vegetables they go into the quinoa. It's so delicious. So, think about these kind of things. Um, at the bottom of the page here. They have the food groups, the carbohydrates and the fiber, the proteins and the fat. They have the phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals. This is what we get from plants. And then we have water. So water is important. If you want to figure out how much water you need, take your weight and add a zero at the end and then divide by three, 30. Or you could take your weight and divide by three. That's how many ounces you need. So if you were um, 150 pounds, you need 50 ounces. That makes sense. So um, thinking about that, um, try to get that much. If you have kidney disease, you might need a little bit more, um, but not much more. Like if you only need, I would say a third or a half more, it will do it. Don't, don't double it. So if you needed 50 ounces, don't get a hundred, get, you know, 75 or, you know, 70, that would be good. They're finding that if you're drinking too much water, uh, people with kidney disease, they're just blowing through their kidneys. So it's just too hard. Um, you want your blood to be thin, you know, so that the, the kidneys can easily filter things out, but you don't want it to be powerfully thin. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that, but just have, you know, the amount of liquids that you're supposed to have. And that includes soup, um, grapes and watermelon. Um, it, it, they don't have a lot of carbs in them. They're a lot of water, uh, whether you're drinking some seltzer or herbal tea, coffee, tea, that kind of thing. Um, that's a wonderful thing. Um, we have a little bit of time. I have some news that I want to talk about. But I also want to give you a couple hints. Um, I uh, I went to Drexel, and Drexel's big with uh, sports nutrition. And I was just watching a, a seminar on that, and they were saying, have your food accessible. So, you know, if you're going to have uh, the little halos, take the skin off and peel them. Then the people will eat the halos. People just don't want to get orange on their fingers. I don't know. Same thing with grapes. Take them off the stems. Uh, then the, you'll eat the whole thing. Um, this this was a really big bowl this morning. Take them off the stems and oh, my husband ate half my grapes. Well, I have to go to the store, but I'm not doing that until like 
I go to the store midweek. I'm just going to confess. I'm never going to go to the store during the week. They don't need my germs at that point, and I don't need their germs. My kids are in college, and I don't know what they're doing. I do. I, they're very good, but you never know. The other thing is I'm getting enough fluids in, so I need to have, this is a 16-ounce glass, and I need to have four of these. And honestly, once I have a glass, I can't remember I know I filled it up once or twice. Did I fill it up three times or four times? I put rubber bands on them. So um, right now I've drank one glass of, of, of water and I put the rubber band on the counter and now I have three more glasses to drink because I have three rubber bands on here. And at the end of the day, I want to see four, four rubber bands on the counter and my glass is empty. So that's how, how you do it. Every time you drink a glass, you take a rubber band off and put it on the counter. Um, some people need five glasses. Some people only need three. So again, take your weight, divide it by three. That's how many fluid ounces you need. And um, and get it in a big glass because he wants to keep going back and forth on this little six ounce glass. Um, okay, so let's talk about, let's see, we talked about the food groups. Um, we talked about, um, you know, balancing your meals, uh, eating. We want to eat three times a day uh, within two hours of waking up, midday, and then within uh, four hours of going to bed. Um, if you can eat every six hours, that will really benefit you. Your body does so much better with three moderate meals as opposed to not eating all day long and then sitting down to dinner with this, you know, three quarters of your of calories or, or at dinner time. You want to have a quarter of your calories at dinner time and three quarters of your calories for breakfast and lunch. Um, so eating every six hours, having lots of fiber um, and, and fluids. Um, what else do you say? Um, I say eat at three meals. Um, have your meals at about the same time, uh, if you can. So if you're going to have breakfast um, at seven o'clock every time, and then it's the weekend, try to have it around seven or eight again, even on the weekend. Uh, same thing with dinner. If you know every night you're eating your dinner around seven, and then on the weekends you're going to eat it at four or five, your body is going to be, you're just going to do better if you eat it later. Eat it at the same time. I do not uh, advocate eating a, a later dinner. If you got to have a, if you eat dinner at five and you go to bed at midnight, yeah, you might eat a snack around nine or ten. And again, all four food groups. Maybe it's cheese and crackers. The cheese is the protein and the fat, and the crackers is the um, uh, carbs and fiber. So that's how that works. Apples and peanut butter, grapes and crackers, whatever you want to do. Grapes and cheese. Um, so I got some uh, some interesting things about. Um, uh, in the news, this is the emails things that I got. It's actually on two pages, but I'm just going to go over two of them. They're really important. Um, getting rid of the cheat day um, is a good idea for the holidays. Um, allowing yourself to indulge with food over the holidays should not be considered cheating on your diet, which should trigger feelings of guilt and shame and negatively affect your mental health, said a, a dietitian. She recommends avoiding strict diets, practicing portion control, and making simple, healthy changes to eating or exercising routines. So if you can exercise after a meal, that brings your blood sugar down really nicely. Um, if you're having um, the food groups, you know, the carbohydrates and the fiber and the proteins and the fats, um, plenty of water, and you don't need a snack between breakfast and lunch, or you don't need a snack between lunch and dinner, then you're having enough breakfast, you're having enough lunch. Um, eat defensively. Select the <clears throat> most, when it's for the holidays, eat defensively. So select mostly the vegetable dishes to fill up before the meats and the high carbs and sweets and fats. So another one, aim for an earlier dinner. So if you're going to have Thanksgiving dinner at like seven or eight o'clock at night, where do you think all those calories are going to go? Just straight to your gut, the, the, the fat on your belly. You cannot use them unless you know you're going to the gym after Thanksgiving or Christmas. I don't think so. So talk to your family, see if you can have that big meal, you know, at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, go for a walk afterwards. You're going to sleep so much better. You're going to feel better. And you're not going to have that excess weight gain that's so hard to get off. So aim for an earlier dinner, avoid post-dinner snacking, and beware of huge late night meals. Fill up on healthy liquids before the meals and snacks, 16 ounces of water, tea, or broth. Know your domino foods. Do not use low, low blood sugars as an excuse to eat junk foods. Um, sometimes you'll have some of the, whatever the junk food is, and you're like, well, I already had that. I might as well have another one. No, you know what your domino foods are. Try to avoid them during the holidays. Um, enjoy, you know, more of the healthy, unique, like different mushroom soups and things that you normally don't make. Um, 
indulge in those. Um, don't graze on small portions resulting in carb stacking through the day. Eat only at your meals. So if you know you're going to have a big meal at two o'clock, have a reasonable breakfast and save yourself until that big meal. Um, but they're going to be happening, the little appetizers and things. Um, if you want to keep them on a plate and have them until just before you eat, that's another idea. Um, but the carb snack, carb stacking really happens. So if you have your breakfast and then two hours later you have, um, I don't know, cheese and crackers and grapes because that's out. And then two hours later, you're still waiting for dinner. Maybe they have the shrimp or the um, bacon wrapped whatevers. And, and then there's some nuts. And, and so your blood sugar has been up ever since you had breakfast. You're not giving it the time, the two hours it needs to go back down. <clears throat> and after you eat, you know, and it's two hours later, your blood sugar goes down. Give your GI tract a break. Don't eat again. Let your the GI tract be empty for you know a couple of hours. <clears throat> so just gonna take one of my drinks of water with the rubber bands. <clears throat> pack your hunk. Uh, if you're gonna be traveling, pack your healthy lunch or meal with traveling instead of relying on the convenience foods. Um, I have a few people who are keep talking to me. Well, I'm on the road. You know, what about this cheese and crackers? What about these grapes and and you know nuts or whatever? A lot of times you can find something healthy, so that's nice. But why risk it? You know what you like. If you really like this hummus with a zucchini strips or you like, you know, some kind of a salted cracker or a seedy cracker that goes great with this, you know, special cheese, bring it in a little cooler in the car. Um, hummus doesn't have to be refrigerated until you open it. It has to be so think about things that, you know, have to be a refrigerator or what, whatever your snack is. But if everybody else is having hoagies and you're having this delicious, you know, whatever it is, maybe a miso salad or broccoli salad or something like that, it's a whole lot more nutritious. It even has more protein than a lot of these things. So plan for your trips so you don't have to rely on the convenience food. Um, my daughter's at Pittsburgh and... Um, a pit and there's this place um is it sliding hill um that uh is the one i think that is the one uh stop the you know highway stop whatever yeah rest stop that actually has good food there's some of them that just have a roy rogers with, with chicken there's like no chance for a salad or vegetables <laughs> it's like get in the car you're feeling horrible after six hours in the car and then you got this bad food in there too take care of yourself pack what you like to have or know where you're going to go so that you can get a good a good meal. Um, there's a study: a low-fat vegan diet improves weight loss and metabolism. Imagine that: low-fat vegan diet. So again, these are plant-based proteins, and um, they don't have as much fat in them, so naturally they're low-fat. A study in JAMA Network found that overweight adults who followed a low-fat plant-based diet lost more weight and body fat as well as burned more calories after 16 weeks compared to those who followed the usual American diet. The findings based on data from 244 overweight adults also revealed that low-fat vegan diet was tied to improved insulin sensitivity. That's because the fat didn't block those insulin receptors. Again, having lots of vegetables, lots of proteins, you're in good shape. Um, exercise or di diatribe. Making Sense of Diabetes. This is a great website, Diatribe. Exercise well with your CGM, Continuous Glucose Monitor. I think this is important. A lot of people are using a glucose monitor. So how often someone does aerobic exercise for 45 minutes or more helps determine their risk of hypoglycemia. Because that's a big thing. When you have diabetes, you don't want to exercise too much because you might pass out because of low blood sugar, right? The so hypoglycemia uh, resulting from that exercise, the less you exercise, the greater your risk for hypoglycemia. Hypos. Uh, people who intensely exercise more than two bouts of 45 minutes per week, two bouts, are at a low risk. So they can exercise and they're not going to have hypos. Those who intensely exercise only once a week uh, for 45 minutes are at moderate risk. There's a chance that they could have a hypo. People who don't exercise at all, there are no 45 minute bouts of exercise, zero times per week, are at a very high risk for having hypos. So if you want to avoid hypos, get out and exercise. And there was even a study, 11 minutes a day make a difference. And if you can do 11 minutes after breakfast and 11 minutes after dinner, you're gonna reduce your blood sugar, you're gonna keep your heart really strong. Um, and you're, if you do exercise, you're not gonna have this threat of hypos. To lessen the risk of hypoglycemia, the proper recommended, recommended uh, is 
recommended that different specific starting glucose levels can be considered. So those for a high risk of hypoglycemia, they should start exercise at a glucose level as high as 160, 161, 165. So that way their sugar is already up when they exercise, they're gonna come down into like a, you know the hundreds or nineties and they're gonna be comfortable. Those with moderate risk should start at 145 milligrams per deciliter. So your glucose reader is going to read 160 if you're at a high risk of hypos, 145 if you're at a low risk, and 126 if you are at a, you're not worried about hypos. At least go out at 126. Don't go out at 100. You, you might just not have the energy that you need. People with hypoglycemia unawareness preceding um, episodes of hypos and those who are older than age 65 are potentially at increased risk of hypoglycemia with exercise and should start glucose levels at, a, at the higher range, like at 160. And before you're going on a hike, make sure your blood sugar is up, you know, in the 160s and you should be fine. Um, if you read, if your um, glucose comments reader summary says that you are having hypos four to eight percent of the time, um, then you are at moderate risk. So if you're having it eight percent of the time or more, that's high risk for hypos. And if you're having it only four percent or less, then you're at a low risk for hypos. So take a look at what your reader says. Take a look at the exercise that you do. And like I said, if you can exercise every day, even 15 minutes after breakfast, ugh, it's going to do such good things for you. Oh yeah. We have a couple more minutes. Exercising 11 minutes per day can lengthen your life. The research published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found that 11 minutes of daily exercise on average could help lengthen lives by fighting age-related conditions such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The study found that participants who counteracted sedentary activity with a limited 11 minutes of moderate to vigorous daily exercise were less likely to die than those who engaged in just two minutes of exercise per day. If you can get up to averaging 11, so that's 10 minutes someday and 15 minutes another, that's good. Black seed has many ben benefits. Again, it's something you can add to smoothies or salads or soups or uh, granola mixes that can bump up your fiber, and that's always good. Um, an Okinawa diet is um, it may hold the key to longevity. So in Okinawa, they live over 100 years. It's one of those blue zones. The Okinawan diet, the blue zone diet that is associated with longevity is primarily made up of green and yellow vegetables, root vegetables, soy-based foods, and mushrooms. Registered dietitian says that they're the diet also features limited intake of refined processed foods, highly sugary items, salt, and full fat dairy products. And that article was in good housekeeping. So um, that shows that nutrition is trying to get out to the everyday person, not just dietitians like me. So um, I have to say, I'm glad to see that good housekeeping is keeping um, you know, studies like this in their magazine. Um, black currants reduce postprandial blood glucose. This is a scam article. So it's telling you, oh, you need black currants in your diet because they, um, well, I'll just read it. People who consume 75 grams, that is like a quarter cup, of black currants along with um, a product and fermented quinoa experience reductions in postprandial maximum glucose and insulin and a delayed fall of glucose compared with those who consumed a control product of sugar water. So they're comparing whole grains and berries to sugar water. This is why I say this is a scam. The findings in the British Journal of Nutrition indicate that the required portion size for black currants to have beneficial effects on post-meal sugar response in smaller than previously thought. So yeah, um, if you're going to have pineapple smoothies um, uh, with your breakfast cereal and almond milk, that is 100% carbohydrates. If you're going to include uh, blueberries on a whole grain granola, I have a great granola recipe. I think I put it on Facebook. I'll put it on after this if you have to. But um, take a look at that. There's a lot of nuts and seeds and oats and I have coconut in there if you like it. You just mix it up with some honey. Um, but flax seeds and chia seeds along with sunflower seeds and nuts and like I just gave you the recipe right now. It's a half a cup of everything except for the seeds. That's a half a quarter cup. Um, but yes, so berries, it just shows that uh, they're not as many carbohydrates, they have great fiber, and they don't need to have your blood sugar um, go as high. And the other thing I want to talk to you about is, um, oh, there was a poor diet. Let's see, we have, we have a little, little bit more time. A poor diet quality raises early onset of colorectal, colorectal cancer risk. 
So this is colon cancer. A study in the Journal of National Cancer Institute reported that higher odds of near early onset high risk rectal and distal um, adenon ad ad adenomas, adenomas. This is um, the polyps um, among women, uh, adults with poor diet quality compared to those with better diet. The findings were based on about 30,000 women emphasized the role of diet in early onset colorectal cancer. And um, it's on the full, the first full story is on helio. This is back in our. Uh, Number third. Um, in their comprehensive analysis of the prospective cohort nurses health study two, investor, uh, investigators assessed the effect of two dietary patterns, the Western and prudent diet, prudent diet, that means eat a good diet. They don't tell you what it is, but just the Western diet. So it's gonna be um, not a lot of fiber, not a lot of vegetables, a lot of fats and proteins. Um, and three recommended uh, based indexes, the Dietary approaches to stop hypertension, that's the DASH diet, alternative Mediterranean diet, that's AMED, and the alternative healthy eating index, that's the AHE diet. On the risk of early onset colorectal cancer using early onset adenomas and those of high malignant potential as surrogate exponents. And the analysis in included all these 30,000 women who already underwent at least one lower endoscopy before age um, 50, um, and this was back in 2011. So these people were already at risk and they looked at their diet, they had the American standard diet or eat well, that kind of thing. They didn't give them guidelines. And they also did um, Mediterranean diet and DASH diet. And in this, um, uh, the results showed women who had a higher Western diet pattern indicated high consumption of red and processed meats were less likely to exercise or use multivitamins and more likely to have a greater number of smoking. Conversely, the women who were adherent to the um, DASH diet and stuff, they were likely to demonstrate healthier lifestyle. And um, they, so at the end, it says that there was a positive association they found the Western diet, positive association means the more Western diet they ate, the more adenomas they had, the more cancer they had. And it was the inverse for um, uh, um, the other diets. So they, when they had more of the DASH diet and the healthy Mediterranean diets, they had less colorectal cancer. This is huge. So cancer, colon cancer, you really don't know you have it until you're like stage four. So think about incorporating more vegetables, more fiber into your diet, because Colon cancer, that sucks. <laughs> I don't want anybody to have it. So we can think about that. Um, the studies are showing a lot of interesting things. Tune in with me on the first week and the second, uh, first Wednesday and the second Wednesday of every month for January, February, and March. We'll see what happens after that. And um, it's like from 12 to 1 on Zoom. And then it gets um, recorded on Thursdays. You know, the recording is posted on Thursdays but I would love to have some more people join me. Um, it's a snowy winter day right now, so I didn't expect many people to come, but um, hopefully in January, we'll see more of you. The first one I think is January 3rd, so um, it's right up there. I uh, look forward to seeing everybody. If you have any questions, again, check my website, amblernutrition.com. Um, you can go to my Facebook page with Facebook Ambler Nutrition. I'm Kirsten Puskar. And my phone number is 215-527-4193. You can text me or call me and we can meet or I can just answer your questions. But whatever I can do to help everybody live a better life, I'm happy to do it. Have a great day and uh, happy holidays for the winter. And I'll see you in January. Take care.